Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, welcome back. It's just gone two o'clock. I'm Bethany Elsie with your top stories from the GB newsroom. A record number of migrants, almost 46,000, crossed the English Channel to the UK in 2022. The last crossings took place on Christmas Day when 90 people made the journey from France on two small boats. It brings the total number for the year to 45,756. That's 60% higher than the figure for 2021, when more than 28,000 migrants crossed over. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has promised to bring in laws this year to make it clear to those who enter the country illegally that they won't be allowed to stay. Pope Francis has paid his respects to his predecessor whilst addressing worshippers at the Vatican this morning. Pope Benedict XVI died within the Vatican City at the age of 95. Tomorrow morning, his body will be brought to St Peter's Basilica, where people will be able to pay their respects. He will lie in state there for three days until his funeral on the 5th of January. Celebrations to mark the start of 2023 have taken place across the nation, including in central London, where a crowd of more than 100,000 gathered to watch the New Year fireworks display. <laughs> London's mayor says the 12-minute display, which is the first since the start of the pandemic, is the biggest in Europe. The sold-out show featured a tribute to the late Queen Elizabeth, highlighted the Lionesses' Euros win and showed solidarity with Ukraine. 
But it was a much quieter affair in Scarborough thanks to Thor, the Arctic walrus. The Yorkshire County cancelled its New Year fireworks display to avoid causing him any distress. He was spotted in the town's harbour and it's thought to be the first one ever seen in the county. He's since moved on and experts say he was likely just taking a break before a long journey north. In his New Year message to Ukraine, President Volodymyr Zelensky says he hopes the war with Russia will end this year. He spoke as missiles rained, in, rained down in and around the capital, Kiev. Ukraine's armed forces says Russia has launched more than 31 missiles and 12 airstrikes at targets across the country overnight. Curfews ranging from 7pm to midnight made celebrations for the start of the New Year impossible in public spaces. The Archbishop of Canterbury is urging the government to tackle what he calls the country's broken social care system. Justin Welby used his New Year message to say care homes are struggling to cover energy bills and to retain staff. He's called on everyone to rise to the challenge of repairing the present system. But the government says social care was made a priority in last month's autumn budget. They pledged £7.5 billion in support over the next two years. Two men have been charged with the murder of a non-league footballer who was stabbed to death in Birmingham on Boxing Day. 23-year-old Cody Fisher was attacked at a nightclub in Digbeth. 21-year-old Cammy Carpenter and 22-year-old Remy Gordon will appear before magistrates on Monday. And from today, more than 4,600 bus routes across England will have fares capped at £2 for a single trip. More than 130 operators outside of London have joined the scheme, which will last until the end of March. The cap is being paid for with £60 million of money from the government. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. I'll bring you more updates in an hour's time. But now it's time for a GB News special programme, A Royal Year, with our reporter, Cameron Walker. Twenty twenty two is the year the royal family changed forever. We said goodbye to our beloved Queen and welcomed in a new king. I'm Cameron Walker, GB News's royal reporter, and I'm taking you on a journey looking back on a major year for the royals and the enormous constitutional change that has engulfed Great Britain. Coming up, we look back on a jubilant weekend of pomp and pageantry when the country came together to celebrate the Queen's seventy years of service. For us all to be celebrating, not just the Queen, but life, our lives, our, our being together again, was, I think, something very, very special. We'll share details of why Prince Andrew might have decided to settle out of court with his accuser. It's often a strategy that they utilise just to make something go away. Plus, Alistair Stewart and Arlene Foster reflect on what the passing of the Queen means for Great Britain. February marked the 70th anniversary of the Queen's accession to the throne. Her late majesty was just 25 years old. I've come to Sandringham when on the eve of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, she hosted a magnificent reception in the ballroom of Sandringham House for locals. The Queen renewed her pledge she made on her 21st birthday that her life would always be devoted to our service and declared it was her sincere wish that Camilla would one day be known as Queen Consort. Former Mayor of Kings Lynn, Councillor Harry Humphrey, welcomes the Queen to the ballroom. I expected really to be one of the, me, one of the people at the reception, but I was particularly honoured when I got there to say, where do I stand? And they said, took me over to the door. And I thought, why? Oh, because you're going to receive the Queen when she comes into her ballroom. I thought, what an honour. Absolutely fantastic. That was a wonderful moment. Her late Majesty was President of Sandringham's Women's Institute. Yvonne Brown is the chairman and was invited to the reception. Obviously she looked frailer because we'd had Covid and the Duke had died and everything, but she looked really, really well. Do the 
<laughs> she asked us how we'd all got on during COVID and what we'd been up to and, you know, just chatted like she always does when she used to come to the meetings. Well, that intimate reception for locals was followed by a global performance of pomp and pageantry. I remember it well. GB News' platform was just the other side of the road and provided us and you with a great view of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee weekend. The Queen watched the traditional Trooping the Colour parade from the Buckingham Palace balcony. Her family joined her for the spectacular RAF fly past. The number 70 was shapes in the sky. Despite one or two tantrums, crowds cheered for the pageant celebrating different decades of Her Majesty's reign. And we had the privilege of seeing the Queen alongside three generations and her three heirs. To the public's delight, Her Majesty also made a surprise appearance alongside Paddington Bear. Katie Nicholl is the royal editor of Vanity Fair. Her book, The New Royals, contains new stories from family members, palace courtiers and aides. There was such a global interest in this sort of mammoth four-day celebration of, of the Queen's 70 years on the throne. And I remember speaking to many people there who weren't even monarchists. They were people who wanted to come and soak up the atmosphere, who wanted to bring their children down to be a part of history in the making, and of course to try and get, for those who were royalists, to, to have a glimpse of the Queen. And I do remember just having that sense of almost this being a bit of a swan song, that this was the final farewell. I mean, the Queen did look very, very frail, albeit happy to be there, but very frail. And I do remember thinking, I wonder if we'll ever see her on this balcony again. The public reaction, the mood, it was one, it was quite emotional now that the Queen's no it, longer it, with absolutely. us. Absolutely. But the fact that they were so clearly in love with the late Queen. Oh, they were so happy to see her. I mean, I think there was a sense of jubilation because people had been able to come together. I mean, because of COVID, there hadn't been this sort of mass gathering for two years. So for us all to be together, for us all to be celebrating, not just the Queen, but life, our lives, our, our being together again, was, I think, something very, very special for, for people that were there. And on the balcony, it was, the decision was made that only working members of the royal family would be there, which meant no Prince Andrew, and yes. it meant no Harry and Meghan. A decision for the palace which perhaps caused some controversy. What do you think were the reasons behind that? Well, I think the decision for it to be just working royals on that balcony was, was the right decision. Um, I think, you know, it was reflective of the direction that the monarchy has been moving in and is certainly moving now under the reign of Charles. And it was a way of neatly sidestepping two particularly difficult issues, the Sussexes and, and the rift at the heart of the House of Windsor. And of course, Prince Andrew, I mean, it would have been absolutely awful for Andrew to have been up on that balcony and would have detracted from the star of the show, who was, and absolutely rightly so, the Queen. Do you think there was any sense of Charles wanting to portray a slimmed down monarchy for when eventually he took over? Charles's slimmed down vision of the monarchy is something that he's always wanted. And it's something, that image of the Queen and then the three heirs is something we're probably never going to see again no, in our we're, lifetime. Well, we've not had a monarch and three reigning heirs, so it was a really powerful, important, historic image. Prince Louis appeared to have a little bit of a tantrum. Yeah. Will and Kate, I suppose, it's a big um, decision for them to decide how much exposure to give their children Absolutely. at events like this. Absolutely. Well, when we saw the Cambridge children in the carriage procession, I remember thinking, goodness, I mean, I don't know if I would trust my four-year-old in, in a carriage. <laughs> and there was the, the Duchess looking pristine in, in white, absolutely immaculate, as she always does, with these three beautiful, impeccably behaved children who knew to dip their heads when the colour passed. I mean, it was little details like that that showed you as much as the Cambridges and now the Waleses have done a brilliant job in raising these three children, giving them an ordinary life with play dates at the palace and going to pretty ordinary, albeit very privileged schools. They're also being schooled in that duty. And, um, you know, to see them up on that palace balcony was a wonderful treat, I think, for all royal watchers, a reminder of the next generation of royalty, and so an important image in that respect. But I think it also humanises the royal family. It makes them all the more relatable. So yes, seeing little Louis having something of a, a royal tantrum in the royal box, well, you know, hats off to the Duchess for her coolness when, you know, she knew that cameras would be trained on her. 
And I particularly liked the Prince of Wales stepping in to say, come and pass him over to me and putting Louis on his lap and having that wonderful moment where you saw him not actually as the Prince of Wales, but as a grandfather. I also caught up with Pandora Forsyth. Pandora is the host of the Daily Express's Royal Roundup. The royal family must be so proud of this summer just gone. It was genius. Everything from drones going in the sky, getting that modern twist on everything, through to those iconic moments uh, where we saw Prince Louis having his cheeky, cheeky behaviour, through to the late Queen um, who came out um, on a couple of occasions. The Queen, we know, had mobility issues. There was no guarantee we actually would have seen her. Um, I know on the build-up to it, it was very much on the day to see how she was feeling. We were very, very lucky to share that moment with her. And it will be memories, I'm sure, which will last all of our lifetimes. We've never seen anything like that. And I'm sure, actually, we'll never see anything like that again. Only working members of the royal family on the balcony. Of course. No Harry and Meghan? No, no. Prince Andrew? No. Um, that would have been the Queen's decision. Everything that we saw would have gone past the Queen. I think that set a very good standard, a very good precedent to what we will now see moving forward. I mm. can't stop talking about it without <laughs> referring yes. to the Queen and her surprise afternoon tea with oh, Paddington Bear. This was so sweet. And this is exactly what I'm talking about in terms of engaging the younger generations. Paddington Bear is, uh, is a British icon, I think, um, for me anyway. And from whatever generation you're from, you'll know Paddington Bear. Um, and it also gave a very sweet moment recently with her passing, where the Queen Consort actually gave out some of those bears which were lined, lined outside the mall all the way through to the palace where people left flowers bears, some of them left marmalade sandwiches, didn't they? Which they got told, you need to stop bringing marmalade sandwiches. But yes, uh, she gave them, I think, to Bernardo's charity, just a few selection of them. Coming up, was Will and Kate's Caribbean tour an unwelcome reminder of colonialism or unfair social media sensation? Those were images of the past, of imperial rule. And Alistair Stewart reveals what was going through his mind as he broke one of the most important stories of his career. You just know that an awful lot of people will be mm. listening and watching and, and, and it is a determination uh, to try and get it right. Looking ahead to this afternoon and the UK is looking cold with rain and hill snow over Scotland, showers and bright spells elsewhere. Here's the details. Patchy rain and hill snow will continue to gradually clear to the east, but it will remain mostly cloudy with hill fog lingering in places. A mostly cloudy day to start the new year across Northern Ireland. There will also be some patchy light rain at times. There'll be a mixture of bright and sunny spells along with scattered showers across northwest England. The showers will be heavy and blustery at times. Bright or sunny spells will edge in from the west, although it will stay rather cloudy in the east. There'll be locally heavy blustery showers in the west too. It's a rather cloudy and windy start to the new year across the Midlands. An isolated heavy shower is possible in the west. A mild day for all. Cloudy and overcast conditions will persist across East Anglia with limited bright spells. The odd shower is also possible. Cloud will thicken across southern England with outbreaks of rain edging in from the south, turning heavy at times. Rather windy too, especially along the coast, but feeling mild for all. And that's how the weather's shaping up for the rest of the day. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6pm for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Welcome back. Now, the royal family was sent around the world in the spring to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, perhaps in an attempt to shore up support for the monarchy in Commonwealth countries. Charles and Camilla's visit to Canada proved on the whole a success. The biggest challenge arguably came from Prince William and Catherine's tour to Belize, Jamaica and the Bahamas. The then Duke and Duchess of Cambridge helped restore coral reefs by going scuba diving. William played football with the locals and Kate focused on early childhood development. But what should have been a goodwill mission turned into something quite different. An unfortunate picture of them greeting children through a wired fence echoed for some the historical slave trade. A ride on an open-top Land Rover used by Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip decades before was described by local campaigners as colonial. So was it a disaster? Social media sensationalists seem to think so. I'm not so sure, but what do my guests think? Firstly, I spoke to Professor Rosalie Hamilton. Rosalie is a Jamaican academic and remembers the trip well. I think over the last few years, and certainly within, over the last few months, especially since the royal visits of William and Kate, the information that the royal family started and profited from the trafficking of Africans and the enslavement of Africans was a wake-up call for many Jamaicans. They didn't know that. Some people would argue, Rosalie, that the current royal family had absolutely nothing to do with what happened 200 years ago when the historical slave trade was going on. But perhaps your argument is that the current royal family are indirectly still profiting. Not only have um, the royal family continued to benefit from that wealth, but on the other side, Jamaicans, Caribbean people, and people who have come out of this process of colonization continue to live with the negative legacies of that colonial process. Before they arrived, the Advocates Network in Jamaica, which you are a part of, wrote an open letter to them, didn't you? So just explain what it said. We thought that 
it was really inappropriate at a time when the country could least afford it for royals to be, to be welcomed in our country to celebrate um, an anniversary of their grandmother. We didn't feel that connection. But there were also what appeared to be hundreds, if not thousands of people bring, coming out to support Will and Kate on the tour, cheering, waving flags. What do you say to that? The best evidence we have is a recent poll that was done in July of this year. And that poll suggested that about 27% of Jamaicans still support the royal family. The support is declining. Jamaica is the only country that still has a monarch, the British monarch as head of state, is the only country that requires a visa to go to Britain. And importantly, a visa to access our highest court of appeal, the Privy Council. Now that has really troubled a lot of Jamaicans because they see that as unfair. So Will and Kate's Caribbean tour proved controversial, perhaps for a number of reasons. Some people were saying that it looked too colonial um, and it didn't sit well with Jamaicans, did it? It absolutely did not. Um, those were images of the past of imperial rule. And I think it concretized in the minds of many that that old subservient type relationship persist. And other kinds of images where, you know, they were dancing with people in the culture yard and so on, were images that are more modern and reflective. But the fact that those images coexisted with, with other kinds of contradictory images suggested a lot that at the core, not much has changed. The thing that frustrates me about the coverage of um, the photograph of Will and Kate greeting kids through a wired fence is because Raheem Sterling, a Jamaican football player, had exactly the same image pretty much taken on exactly the same day, but it didn't get nearly as much criticism, did it, as Will and Kate's did. So what are your thoughts on that? Those images don't and can't distort and, and shift the real experiences of our people. Images don't whitewash that. And so it's, it, it's the actual experience that we have of a monarch as head of state that seems inconsistent with our reality. I think it was very much a mixed reaction, wasn't it? Uh, we all saw all those pictures uh, with the hands through the fence. It shone a light on issues which have been surrounding the royal family uh, for years. However, I do think that Kate, Catherine and William had no malice or ill intent behind that. And I think it's important moving forward, they are aware of those issues and people do hold resentment towards them in some parts of the world. And it's important to acknowledge that. Mm. And if people aren't listened to, that's when relations really do, do go down the pan. Because the issue with uh, the protesters, particularly in Jamaica, was calls for reparations from the British mm -hmm. states, the royal family. Mm -hmm. Will and Kate weren't alive then. No, the Queen wasn't alive then. So do you think the whole intent of the, of the tour was lost on social media because that was the narrative that went viral? Yes, I think if the royal family had their way, then every bit of coverage and every bit of press would be positive. But we wouldn't be doing our jobs unless we really gave a real account of what happened. It was a difficult situation for them, particularly with, do you remember the open top Land Rover that they stood on? Yes. And some criticism came from that saying it was too colonial. But actually that was the Jamaican government who asked them to do that. The royal family is so based on tradition. They like bringing in old traditions along the way um, and bringing them into modern life. I think now more thought process needs to go behind these these moments. Mm -hmm. It's not of a time where, you know, every single 
uh, newspaper is going to back that. And I think what they did do pretty well with, with social media is release those videos of the two of them scuba diving. Um, showing the underwater world, of course, conservation yeah. a huge issue for William in particular. Mm. There was lots of positives on this tour too, right? Yeah, lots of positives, lots of great photo moments to take away. In fact, I remember some of the photos being on some of the front covers. Another example of the pomp and pageantry of the United Kingdom was the first state visit yes. of King hosted, the first time, of course, as mm -hmm. monarch, he hosted the South African president, uh -huh. Cyril Ramaphosa. And all of the pictures that, that we're seeing are extremely positive, aren't they? Extremely positive. And one thing, actually, which is good about having an older monarch is he has been able to establish these relationships throughout the years, which the late Queen, I will not speak of her service in a bad way, but... She didn't have that experience when she came to the throne. The king has had years of experience and he's learned from the very best. Therefore, it's more natural for him now to be able to host these, these banquets and actually have real conversations. With his speech just before the state banquets got up and running, as it were, we're inside the ballroom of Buckingham Palace. A couple of things stood out to me, yes. the first of which was he repeated what he said at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting mm -hmm. earlier this year, where he said we need to recognise the wrongs which this country have done, perhaps referring to the historical slave trade yep. once again, almost willing a conversation to start. Yes, he did. That in itself was huge. I think the royal family have shied away from that for a very, very long time. It is showing a completely new reign, a completely new, more perhaps modern outlook on things. I think people just want to hear that, you know, the royal family haven't always been perfect and they're acknowledging the history. His relationship with the Commonwealth is so important. Coming up, Dame Arlene Foster reveals what it was like in the room when Charles was formally proclaimed king. He lost his mother on the Thursday. Here he was on the Saturday morning, standing in front of all of his privy councillors. Uh, they're his privy councillors now, and uh, it was quite a moment, I have to mm. say. And to find out why Prince Harry's relationship with the royal family is on a knife edge. If he is seen to be overtly critical and damaging of the royal family as an institution, there will be repercussions to that. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Camilla Tomini. Join me on GB News on Sunday mornings for a politics show with personality. On TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Thanks for joining us here on GB News as we look back on the Royal Family's 2022. Now, if you can remember all the way back to January, Prince Andrew settled out of court in a civil sexual assault case against him with his accuser, Virginia Dufre. The Duke of York has always denied the allegations, but the fallout led to his mother, the late Queen, stripping him of his honorary military titles, and he no longer uses his HRH status. And I predict there is simply no way back for him as a working member of the royal family. Kinsey Schofield is a royal podcaster and blogger from the United States, where Virginia Dufresne brought legal action against the Queen's son. There was a lot of back and forth, and he had an incredible team that really fought back against Virginia. They said, you don't live in the United States. They struggled with the fact that Jeffrey Epstein was supposed to have you know, collected all of this himself when he paid out some of these alleged victims. It wasn't supposed to touch Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew hid, I, I'm sorry to use the word, but he kind of hid in Balmoral, um, did not want to 
get that summons. And when he inevitably was handed that paperwork, they decided that it wasn't worth fighting, you know, to protect the reputation of the monarchy and to protect the future of the monarchy. I think that he listened to the right people and he decided to settle with Virginia Dufresne so that they could end this controversy. Do you think that's why he did it, to protect the monarchy? Because lots of people fail to understand how someone who maintains they are innocent of any wrongdoing would be prepared to pay out reportedly millions of dollars to a woman he claims to have never met. I agree with you. Um, however, a million dollars is nothing to the royal family. Also in Hollywood, it's often a strategy that they utilize just to make something go away, to end the conversation and to move on. So it's it doesn't seem especially like something that the royal family would do because they're never complain, never explain, but it's a very Hollywood way of going about things. It's an, a very American way of going about things. And I think that he had he had counsel that said, let's make this go away right now. And the easiest solution is to cut a check. It did really haunt the family at the time. And I think that you saw really Prince William and King Charles distancing themselves from Andrew and start the process of really pushing him out because they thought this person is a liability to our family and to our future. And perhaps the Queen also felt that because she stripped him of his honorary military titles, he's no longer allowed to use his HRH status. But this is a man, isn't it, who was born into the royal family, served his country in the Royal Navy, he fought in the Falklands War. How do you think he was feeling at that time? I think where he was really heartbroken was the fact that his mother was ultimately the one that made the decision and Queen Elizabeth had been by his side throughout the entire process. The ultimate hurt there was the fact that he felt like he might have lost his mother in that process, that she might no longer be on his side. Let's turn now to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, who now live in California. Now, the couple secretly visited the UK despite Harry's security concerns to see the Queen in April before jetting off to the Netherlands for the Duke's Invictus Games, which is an Olympic-like competition for wounded veterans. They briefly appeared at the Platinum Jubilee celebrations but swiftly flew back across the pond. But it's the commercial deals which have proved the most controversial. Netflix and Spotify have reportedly paid them millions of dollars. And Harry's imminent memoir is going to make for uncomfortable reading. The title, Spare, quite a loaded title. It's a, it is a loaded title. It's a provocative title. It's thought-provoking. And if the title is one word to sum up how Harry feels, packs a punch. It's pretty powerful. I've spoken to Prince Harry in the past quite a few times. And, you know, more than once he has said to me, I wish I hadn't been born a prince. I, you know, there was, he said to me once, I'd love to just be able to go into a coffee shop and, and buy a coffee to jump on the tube and travel on a train. I think it's very indicative of where the book is going to go. And it suggests that he has always felt on the periphery, an outsider, a spare, a backup, rather than someone in his own right. And, and actually, I, I think that's pretty sad. What I struggle with is the narrative that Meghan forced him out of the royal family. In fact, yes. even before Prince Harry met Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, uh, he wanted to find a way out. Yes, I think you know. I think it's very easy for people to blame Meghan for everything. I mean, the very term Megxit suggests entirely that she's responsible for them leaving. I don't believe that that was the case at all. I think that Harry had been looking for a way out for some time and Meghan was a catalyst and I think I sort of set the record straight in the new royals that you know Harry was just as much behind this decision to leave. This publication of Harry's memoir was meant to come out in the autumn wasn't it? Yes. Why do you think there has been a delay? Well I think the book's been subject to, to several delays it was meant to be coming out in the autumn of 2022 so around that Thanksgiving pre-Christmas market which is a very lucrative time for selling books but I think the Queen's death changed everything and um, Harry had the luxury of being able to to change some of the copy, to update it. I think people reading that book would absolutely want to know his place in the funeral, how he felt about his place in the funeral, how he felt about losing his grandmother. I mean, that journey to Balmoral when he missed the flight with other members of the royal family and went to Balmoral on his own, that's going to be a really powerful and important account to read. How much do you think he will criticise the royal family? 
I think the title suggests um, that he's going to be quite critical. I mean, anyone labelled the spare and who sees their identity as the spare suggests it's not going to be entirely favourable about the royal family. One does wonder if some of the revisions made to bring the book up to speed might also have included some watering down of the manuscript. And I think Harry's also acutely aware that if he is seen to be overtly critical and damaging of the royal family as an institution, there will be repercussions to that. You know, there's the matter of titles here, and I, I suspect very strongly that Charles could revoke their titles and possibly not bestow titles on their children if Harry and Meghan's intention is to continue throwing hand grenades into the royal family. That's the thing, isn't it? It's because arguably brand Sussex only works because they have the titles, because their children now have the rights to be prince and princess. Absolutely. And now that Charles <laughs> is king, there's a real balancing act they've got to do here. Well, Meghan and Harry um, know that their commercial future and the success of their future is absolutely entwined with their royal titles. But if they were to lose their actual royal titles, the Duke and Duchess, that comes at a, at a real cost to them. I mean, suddenly they're star quality is much diminished. Will the public, when they read this book, will they be sympathetic to his cause? People really struggling at the moment. I do think that woe is me narrative is wearing very thin for Harry. And I think if this is a book solely about victimhood, there's every possibility it may not be the bestseller that we are all expecting it to be. We both know Harry and Meghan divide people. You have one side of the argument that says they want privacy. They want to be financially independent. So why are they going on shows like Oprah on a global stage talking about relations with the royal family? We know the royal family is extremely private. But then you also have the other side where people say, hold on, so many people have something to say about them. They deserve a voice too. I'm really curious to know what is the overall feeling of Americans towards Harry and Meghan? I think American perception of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex has changed drastically over the last 12 months. There's a sense of entitlement, a sense of, um, you know, do you always focus on the negative? Is there anything positive going on in your, you know, multi-million dollar mansion? Uh, there they've been caught in a couple of fibs and the United States is starting to recognize it. So I remember when Harry and Meghan first announced that they were going to leave the royal family as full-time working members, move across to America. And one of the reasons for that was because they wanted more privacy. I think the appearances and the branding are Meghan Markle's dream come true. You know, if you read some of these books that really delve into the strategy behind her glow up, you know, she's a smart woman, and some of these things that are happening for her right now are things that she wanted to happen for her when she was little named actress in Hollywood, California, getting her third rejection of the day. Harry, without a doubt, has made Meghan Markle's dreams come true of becoming an international celebrity. Coming up, I'll discuss a defining moment in British history with GB News presenters Alistair Stewart and Dame Arlene Foster. The fact that they had told the Prime Minister and told the Leader of the Opposition, we all knew that it was a serious situation. We are GB News and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. 
Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. Yes. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. Well, it's hard to believe that Queen Elizabeth II, who reigned over us for more than 70 years, is no longer here. The news made headlines around the world and it marked a huge change in our country. For me, I spent most of my time here at Buckingham Palace, but GB News also went around the country to pubs and community centres, hearing your stories and memories of Britain's longest reigning monarch. I sat down with Alistair Stewart and Arlene Foster for their reflections. What do you remember about that day at GB News? I think I remember most strongly the fact that it happened in the midst of a, a, a real-life political storm as well, and, and a couple of events encapsulated the woman's extraordinary life of, of service uh, and of duty, and that is that she, you know, she marched Boris Johnson out as Prime Minister and she marched Liz Truss in as Prime Minister. We all looked at the photographs, and actually we hadn't seen her for a while in reality, and we looked at her and we thought, oh, she's got small, she's looking quite frail, but she gave a lovely smile. Do you remember the lovely smile to yeah. the camera that she gave? And we were all, well, I certainly was, really pleased to see her. And then all of a sudden there was all of this note passing in the Commons and people looking very serious and everybody was wondering what it was. And then it was, the Queen's not well. And the fact that they had told the Prime Minister and told the Leader of the Opposition, we all knew that it was a serious situation because you don't tell senior politicians that you've got a cold or whatever. It was serious. Yeah. And Alistair, you were the one who broke the news on GB News. What was going through your head at that time? Peter Sissons, mm. uh, who was a very close friend of mine and got uh, crucified for a simple uh, minor point about a tie, um, you just know that an awful lot of people will be mm. listening and watching and, and, and it is a determination uh, to try and get it right. You both met the late Queen on a number of occasions. What was she like as a person? I mean, I have so much admiration for the Queen because she was a female leader at a time when there weren't very many female leaders about and she was so young when she came to the throne. I had the great privilege of meeting her in a private audience when I was First Minister and that is a nerve-wracking <laughs> occasion <laughs> when you're thinking about going in to meet the Head of State and, and a, a lady of of her stature um, and when I say her stature she is quite small yes. of course and uh, the photograph of me meeting her I looked like an enormous giant <laughs> beside her <laughs> because I, I'm a lot taller than her. Let's talk about the accession mm. council. First of all the fact that it was televised was very significant wasn't it? 
that was quite extraordinary. It, in so many respects, never seen it before. Read the words, seen pictures of it, seen stills mm -hmm. of it, uh, even Edward VIII. But Penny Morden's a personal friend. Mm -hmm. And she'd only just been made That's Lord right. President of the Council. Absolutely. And she's the woman who keeps the new king waiting while she reads out mm -hmm. the rules of engagement and then privy councillors, including yes. the lovely one next to me, then say, yep, OK, he's the genuine article, he is the heir, and yes, we all agree to it. And it was just magical, because it was constitution, it was politics, mm. it was people we've elected, people who lead us and we can get rid of, yeah. uh, bringing in uh, the guy who is there to do the job of work because he is the eldest son of the now dead monarch. I just thought it was magical. He'd lost his mother on the Thursday. Here he was on the Saturday morning, standing in front of all of his privy councillors. They're his privy councillors now. And uh, it was quite a moment, I have to mm. say. And there were six prime ministers there. Yes. People from Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland and England. And, of course, following the Accession Council, all the flags were raised to full mast mm. just for 24-hour periods, celebrating the new monarch, even though it was mm. only you know, less than two days earlier that we'd lost our old one. So that was an interesting time. It was all of that sort of um, planning that had been there for many, many years yes. kicked in. And it was so smooth. And obviously, because the Queen had passed away in Scotland, there was a whole different arrangement then that had to be gone through in terms of how we would um, progress down to London. And the other moment, which I really did think was special, and, and Arlene and I both adore Parliament and everything mm. that it stands for, both houses yeah. of it, was the number of members of Parliament who chose to accept Lindsay Hoyle's invitation as Speaker to retake mm. their oaths of allegiance. Mm. Labour and Tory, Liberal Democrat across the spectrum, lining quietly up just to declare their loyalty to King Charles and his heirs, etc, etc, etc. And she laid at rest in St Charles Cathedral for 24 hours, particularly symbolic for me because it showed the late Queen was truly a Queen of the United Kingdom. I think sometimes we forgot that here was a, a royal family, here was a new king mourning at that time because he had to go out and go right around the United Kingdom and I, ha I have to say I think it was a stroke of genius, that progress of King Charles around the United Kingdom. So he went to Northern Ireland, he had a service, he went to Scotland, he went to Wales. And it allowed people to show their respect for his late mother, but also their love for him. And I think that that was really, really strong. We were going out and talking to people and asking them why. Why were they standing in a queue for 12, 14 hours? Why did they feel that they wanted to do that? And I think people really loved that. When the new king and the new Prince of Wales went down unexpectedly, unannounced, unplanned, to do a walkabout with the people who were still mm. queuing to go into the Great Hall at Westminster to pay their final respects. And that in itself is extraordinary. Mm. I was really hooked on that because people would queue for hours on, on end. They'd finally get in and it would be five seconds, mm -hmm. six seconds. And may I, one of the standout moments of the whole thing for me it was when James Seven and Louise Windsor, yes. the Wessex children, joined the other grandchildren and stood their vigil. I just thought that was knockout, with Sophie and Edward and others standing in that little gallery in the Great Hall, yes. watching them, like any mum like and dad any mum would. would do. Yeah, exactly. You're right. and she, come back and in here and hold her. You're all right, you did well. But Sophie yeah. looked quite emotional, didn't she? she because thing. she was looking at her children yeah. and thinking, oh, yeah. my goodness. I think it was important that the family did come together because I think everybody was watching what would happen with uh, Harry and Meghan. Um, and at the end of the day, they are a family in mourning. I think it was quite proper for them to come down and meet people and to stay together. Sadly, I have to say this, Cameron, I don't think that unity has lasted. No. Um, and, and I think we're going to see that in the new year. And that's a great sadness to me as a monarchist, that someone within the family system would try and do damage to, to, to what is the system that I think is fabulous for our, for our country and our nation. But I guess if there is one huge challenge for the new king, it is to try and get that family pulling together again, but also to do it in a way that lets everybody out there look in on a family that's sole purpose in reality is to unite the country mm. and it ain't at the moment. The state's funeral itself mm. was clearly such a historical moment for so many reasons. 
It was really sombre and I had the great privilege and honour to be in the cathedral when the coffin went past, when the family walked. How difficult must that have been to walk the whole way from Westminster Abbey uh, up past Buckingham Palace. It was a very difficult thing for them to do but they wanted to do it because it was their last act for their late mother and she was duty personified so I think it was just right that they carried out her wishes to the very last. I think a huge significance as well, talking about Her Majesty's fingerprints having been mm. all over the whole affair, is that it was in Westminster Abbey. That was best for procession. Yeah. That was best for the public to see and pay their final moment of tribute. And she had gone there on so many occasions. Yes. She was someone who really believed that she was a Christian. Horses and, and corgis <laughs> at uh, Windsor Castle. First of all, we had Emma, the Queen's yes. uh, pony. What kind of pony was that, Alice? Well, oh, she didn't only care about and love horses and ponies and clearly rode very well as a child on a pony from the word go. She knew more about that industry and about breeding and about rare breeds than pretty well anybody mm. uh, in the country. Sturdy little fellas, bless their hearts, uh, that she rode out with Terry, uh, the head groom, uh, across Windsor Great Park. Uh, almost towards the yeah. end and would, would, yeah. would never wear a hard hat which used to upset quite a few people. <laughs> Having the two corgis as yes. well, Mick and Sandy, oh, gifted God. by Prince Andrew and now back with Prince Andrew but it was a really emotional moment watching those images. Yeah. And the staff coming out as well, yes. and standing out, um, so many of the staff who, who wanted to pay their respect. Final point for both of you, what do you think is the lasting legacy of Queen Elizabeth II? Oh my goodness, there's so much. She has done so much for the country. Across the world, she's been a global icon. I think her solid leadership has shown for me as a female uh, what uh, women can do in the world in a quiet way. You don't have to be bolshy. You don't have to be out there. You can lead quietly with dignity and integrity. And she has done that. And when I look, one of the, I think the heroine of the whole thing for me is Princess Anne. Yes. She travelled from Scotland with her mother's coffin. When I looked at her on parade, she was as straight backed as any of the men that were there. I think Anne takes on her mother's mantle in respect of female leadership, and um, I think she does a fabulous job. Some damn fine women generally in there. Oh, yeah. In this generation. Oh, and Sophie as well, absolutely. Sophie Wessex, certainly, Princess of, Princess of Wales, Wales yeah. the Queen uh, Consort herself. Oh, absolutely, yeah. For me, her bequest to the nation is the constitutional monarchy. Correct. She showed up against all odds and pressures and strains. She understands why, rather like Churchill on democracy, it may not be perfect, but until you have a look at all of the other systems available, it's not bad. That woman just understood that we politically are in the safest possible hands mm. if we can always elect and reject a government every four or five years, but there is a constancy at the top of it yes. that understands what we care about, and she did, and I genuinely think the new king does as well. The highs and lows are set to continue into next year. The Prince and Princess of Wales have scored a hit with their trip here to the US, where they've met with President Joe Biden, ahead of William's Environmental Earthshot Prize. But it was overshadowed by the release of Harry and Meghan's highly controversial docuseries. Are we facing another fractious year for the royal family? I guess we'll find out. Looking ahead to this afternoon and the UK is looking cold with rain and hill snow over Scotland, showers and bright spells elsewhere. Here's the details. Patchy rain and hill snow will continue to gradually clear to the east, but it will remain mostly cloudy with hill fog lingering in places. A mostly cloudy day to start the new year across Northern Ireland. There will also be some patchy light rain at times. There'll be a mixture of bright and sunny spells along with scattered showers across northwest England. The showers will be heavy and blustery at times. Bright or sunny spells will edge in from the west, although it will stay rather cloudy in the east. There'll be locally heavy blustery showers in the west too. 
It's a rather cloudy and windy start to the new year across the Midlands. An isolated heavy shower is possible in the west. A mild day for all. Cloudy and overcast conditions will persist across East Anglia with limited bright spells. The odd shower is also possible. Cloud will thicken across southern England with outbreaks of rain edging in from the south, turning heavy at times. Rather windy too, especially along the coast, but feeling mild for all. And that's how the weather's shaping up for the rest of the day. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear 